two, one. Yeah, look at that. Episode 404 of Hate to the Show. We're traveling around the world. We got uh, Saeed in the UK, Ali in the Los Angeles, and uh, Lauren, where are you right now? I forgot to ask That's you. in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, New York. But you were in uh, Lebanon last week. How cool. I and, was. Uh, you travel around the world because you got the coolest job. You're a, a writer, <laughs> an author, a photojournalist, a journalist, and a teacher at NYU. And do um, you want to tell us a bit more about uh, the uh, photo rolls lab and uh, um, your work conserving photography? Sure. Um, yeah, I think the the first title maybe to apply to me would be professor. Um, professor. So I'm a... <laughs> No, no, not to correct you. I just meant like that's the <laughs> thing. Professor um, Lauren. So I teach at NYU and I run what's called the photojournalism lab, which um, teaches photojournalism and visual storytelling. But what I think is important about it or extra important about it is that it places a very strong emphasis on thinking about ethical, responsible practice, um, which you know, which means like, how do you cover someone else's story? How do you, what does it mean to be the, the witness to someone else's situation? What does it mean to take their story and put it out there in the world? And how do you think about doing this in the most ethical way that you can? What are some of the questions you should be asking? How do you work with the subject? So that's, mm -hmm. um, that's me at, at the photojournalism lab. And then I also teach classes that you might call them like, humanities or ethics classes. They're almost always about photography in some capacity, but those are for students who aren't necessarily photographers. They're interested in the role that photography plays in society. So we're mm -hmm. thinking about like conflict coverage. This past spring, I taught a course on peace, like what happens when wars conclude and what does peace look like? What does the documentation look like? Um, so things like that. Again, I love thinking about the intricacies of photography. Oh, wow. I mean, um, you know, when I was a kid, um, <laughs> my parents used to tell me that because uh, I'm a filmmaker out here in Los Angeles. I used to be like, I want to be a filmmaker. I love taking photos. I love filming. And then <laughs> my my because I come from Lebanon and just the society and the family, my family will always, will always be like, that's not a, um, that's not that important. <laughs> Taking photos, you know, that's like, uh, or making films and stuff, that's not that impactful or not that serious. But then now that I've driven deeper into the field and I've, we've met so many photojournalists and um, it is, it's just uh, amazing how impactful, you know, uh, journalists are, you know, just a person with a camera in a location um, have like a, uh, can like change the whole situation, can change the whole conflict. And and it's also like, um, also extremely wild to me that all these, you know, top governments, you know, we've interviewed so many journalists from uh, Belarus and China and Russia and all these countries where uh, the government's trying to stop journalists, people with cameras, there's ordinary people with cameras from uh, taking photos. So why is, why is photography so dangerous? I mean, in, t in terms of that, why is it dangerous? I think in the spaces, especially where you see governments trying to control people with cameras, uh, it's because they want to control the narrative ultimately. And I think the people, rightly or wrongly, when they when you show them a photograph, they tend to feel like that, that happened, right? It's true, it's real, right? And we all know at some level that photos can be manipulated. When it's coming from a photojournalist, it obviously should never be manipulated. So we we do trust it as a piece of visual evidence. And that can alert us to things that governments don't necessarily want us to be aware of. Um, so yeah, there's unfortunately a ton of censorship occurring globally in spaces around the world. Oh, wow. And uh, do you want to tell us a bit more about like the impact of photography and what do you, like what are some, what are the, the photos that had the most impact do you think uh, in the world? I think if we're think, you know, in, in broad strokes, the ones that probably are the most impactful are the ones that we would call iconic, right? Mm -hmm. The ones where kind of everyone is like, oh yeah, I know that picture. I know which one you're talking about. Um, so for instance, like it was just the 50th anniversary of that photograph from Vietnam with the mm -hmm. little running naked, right? And that mm -hmm. is an extremely impactful photo. 
Um, I mean, I think in terms of photographic impact, it kind of cuts both ways, right? Like if you said you were talking to somebody from Ukraine um, and there's a lot of photographers working in Ukraine. And on the one hand, it's super important to create the visual evidence. On the other hand, they're, they're kind of going against the stream, right? Like there is so much visual imagery out there that people will start to get fatigued by it or they'll stop paying attention. And I think that, you know, if you, if you think about how Ukraine was covered in late February and early March, mm-hmm. it was like the only headline, right? Like Ukraine, 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 Ukraine. And then I think we did actually start to get to a moment where the public was like, all right, I've been hearing about Ukraine for a while. And right as that was happening is when photojournalists got into Bucha, where there were those executions and massacres. And, I, and there was a lot of visual imagery that got distributed from there. And it was like horrifying, awful, disturbing imagery. And I think that re-grabbed public attention. But I, you know, so I, I would say those were impactful because global leaders had conversations about those executions that took place in Bucha. And I think it was at that moment that the United States, maybe also the UK, committed to giving more money, mm-hmm. for more weapons. So it can, it can have that kind of impact. Right. And it's, you know, it's wild that you have all these top leaders that... Um that know a lot, they have all the information about the situation, they know what's going on, but sometimes they just have to see a clip of it, you know, just like a video. It's one thing, you know, to have all the documents and know that this impact happened or this rocket happened, but to see a video of it crashing, um, you know, as you say, it causes people to get into action. Why is that? I mean, I think people, you know, again, like maybe a little bit has to do with that kind of fatigue level, but also just as you're saying, like, numbers and statistics for the vast majority of people, they, they, they mean something, right? And when you hear that whatever it was, like 15 people were killed in a shopping mall attack yesterday or the day before, and you're like, that's terrible. But I think photos can hit you at a more emotional level, right? Like if you see a survivor of a bombing and you just see them bleeding or grief stricken, it's gonna hit you in a different way. And I think also for the global leaders, the photograph does provide some degree of evidence as well, right? This is this is real, this is happening. Um, so I think, I think that's what the photo can do. I think words can do it sometimes, but I think photos can do it more often and do it faster. Cause it also, you read an, a report or an article and it takes you what, however much time to read and a photo you have seen it in under a second and you can't unsee it like your eye just mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so true. And mm-hmm. also on the, on the point of like how there's, you mentioned the, there's viewer fatigue. Um, how do photojournalists try to combat that so that, you know, the people who are receiving on the receiving end of these videos and these images, they don't get bored of what they're seeing. Because like in the end, that's that's what I notice. People tend to uh, it happens to people when the when the same narrative is always in front of their face, the same headline is in their face. They just get tend to get bored of it, which is obviously a, it's a, a bit tragic to hear. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, it it shouldn't necessarily have to be on the photojournalist's radar to worry mm-hmm. about how the public responds because their role is to be there as a documentarian and to take the pictures and to get the pictures to their editor and to let the editor place the pictures in whatever publication. So on one level, I would say it shouldn't actually influence them. Um, On the other hand, it might, right? Because the reality is they're there in the thick of it and they're seeing how horrific something is and they want the world to pay attention and fatigue is a public fatigue is a pretty terrible thing. You know, I think um, a lot of photojournalists will work to humanize the story, right? Again, like what we were saying, like it's not just it's not just bodies, it's people with lives and children and sons and brothers and to try to make you connect with the image, which then hopefully makes you connect with the story. I think it can go in the wrong direction if the logic becomes the public isn't paying attention. So I need to make the images more graphic or more sensational. Mm. And that's where I think you start to go down a real slippery slope because like how graphic are you going to get in your imagery? And if you're talking about like major media, especially Western or American media, they don't typically run ridiculously graphic stuff, but I will say I have on social media, 
been seeing a lot of really graphic stuff out of Ukraine. Um, you know, and I, I don't know if, if that, how, how useful that is in the end for the public, if they're just going to start to get used to, and then say like, all right, I've seen that before, then like, how far do you go? Okay. Oh, and, wow. And yeah. how do you like introduce these kind of, this kind of uh, viewership, viewership to the social, to social media? Like, is, should we maybe restrict it a bit more so that they don't become This is like the wild. What do you, what do you mean to censorship? Say? What do you mean? No, I'm not. I don't I want to restrict, but <laughs> I'm just saying. But if you, <laughs> but like as we can see, obviously, social media is like the the major platform where people just get, you know, they they just ignore a topic after seeing it a few times. They become numb to the feeling, and due to the the massive amount of diff, uh, different in, like stimuli that they can they receive from, because. In the end, in, on social media, you're just like scrolling. You're going quickly through an image. You don't sit down and like watch it and then there's like an article attached to it or anything of the sort. No, you're just scrolling. You look at it. Sometimes you, some people will read the caption, but they won't follow in. They won't go into this, like com- go into the context or like try to understand what's behind this image. They just look at it and they're like, oh, okay, this is bad. And then keep scrolling. Yeah, I think it's a real issue. Um... I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't necessarily place the burden and certainly not like the entirety of the burden on the photojournalist because I think there's just as much burden on the public to become, like to think about how they're consuming images and to, just like you're saying, right? Like it's really strange, especially when it's a super graphic image to see it completely decontextualized. Um, And so I think, you know, some of the social media platforms do a decent job of putting a kind of warning before you can mm-hmm. see an image, which hopefully asks people to stop for a second and think about like what they're about to look at. Um, but I think, you know, and I'm no different from, from everyone else, right? Like I scroll as well, but I do think the public also has to step up their game in terms of their media literacy um, and think, you know, so if you see something on social media, fine, maybe that's not the place where you get to the article, but then to go to a news site and to try to follow up on like, what is that story? What was, what's going on there? What do I need to know about this? Okay. Um, and what kind of recommendations would you provide hmm. if, if it's uh, for the general public directly or someone who's in, in public office that is responsible for, it, uh, for that, you know, that sphere? Like what kind of approach would you have in their place to kind of change this, uh, the current situation we're in with the approach to social media? I mean, I don't, I don't know how much we can change the the fact that people will distribute whatever they want to distribute on social media, Mm -hmm. but it was interesting for me. And again, going back to my professor hat, it was really interesting to hear from my students this semester that the vast majority of them were learning about Ukraine on TikTok. Um, and, wow. so, and they say things like, I just saw a building get blown up. And then I just saw a celebrity influencer. <laughs> you know, and, and for them, they're like, this is, but that's how they were. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's totally strange, right? And it's not how I mm-hmm. consume my news. But when I was talking to my students, they, the, what they attempted to do was kind of what I was saying. Like, they're not, they're, they're not going to stop using TikTok. Of course not. Um, but what they were trying to do was go more directly when they're not spending time on TikTok to go more directly to like WashingtonPost.com and, and get a more comprehensive coverage. So I do think that that's one way to do this where no one, no one that I know is ready to give up social media. But I think if you can also work with sites and it's easy enough now everything is digital where you feel like okay this is journalism that i trust that will give me a fuller context that to me seems like at least a good starting point um do you mind me asking where do you consume your news um because i have a i struggle finding a good authentic like um you know a reliable news source <laughs> reliable yeah. news source how about that <laughs> phrase yeah do you want to tell us <laughs> i mean i but like exactly to your point point I go through a lot of sources Mm -hmm. um so I every day will be reading New York Times Washington Post Guardian Al Jazeera um because I I also feel like the more you can kind of cross check across 
platforms, mm-hmm. the, the better. Because then mm-hmm. if everything is lining up, then it's then it's accurate, right? It should be accurate. If you're <laughs> noticing disparities, yeah. then that's where you can also start to ask questions. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, what am I gonna ask you about? Um, so g- journalism has changed plenty in the past, you know, a uh, few decades, especially with social media. Right now, we're in the world where, you know, you're talking about, you know, how uh, the public um, reacts to sensationalized um, journalism, but it's also that. Journalism has gotten a lot more sensationalized, if I understand correctly. It's because, uh, um, you know, we're all familiar with the um, the headlines, right? And it's like the click-through rate. That's what people are looking for. Like, what's the most catchy headline? What's the most catchy photo, you know? We're in the game, too. We're in, so we work in social media, so we know about all this stuff. And um, I don't know. To me, that sounds like um, not really authentic news if it's just trying to be a sensationalized version of the news. Um, and it seems a little bit like a conflict of interest if you're going into a conflict zone and you're uh, the only way uh, you can get a story, a scoop is by, um, or a scoop that ever, like most people will click on is if it is something more graphic or more disturbing, or maybe by bending the truth a little bit. Um, so I don't know how, what, and Professor, what do you think is uh, the way to, you know, combat all this? I mean, if someone is bending the truth, that's not journalism anymore, mm-hmm. right? So I, I do think there are, I don't think there's any perfect media organization, but I do think there are organizations that are better than others. And yeah, for sure, you're right. Like the, there's a lot of sensationalized coverage, Um in the United States and plenty of other countries, there's a lot of polarized, cut, right? Like, is it is it Fox or is it MSNBC? <laughs> um, in some regards, this isn't actually new. Uh, so even mm-hmm. if you go back like turn of the century from the 1800s to 1900s, there was a thing called yellow journalism, which was huge headlines and bending the truth. Um, so it's like the people who narrate the world to us have known for a long time that the more sensational something is the greater your public's going to be and they play on this and and in fact prey on this um i think to your point though it's just easier to do it now because there's so many distribution channels um and you can reach more people faster but again that there are ways to combat misinformation and disinformation it's never going to all go away so I tend to come back to this line of that means the public has to be more educated. And if you want to like take in your sensational news or celebrity news, like it's fine as long as you're able to look at it and say, yeah, but this isn't necessarily the whole truth, right? Like if you, if it's a guilty pleasure sort of thing, um, go for it. And then mm-hmm. also go and read the, the vetted journalism. I see what I mean. Like a more educated public would be able to discern that and be like, Oh, this one, is entertainment news. This one yeah. is more serious yeah. news. And, and I don't think mm-hmm. educated in like any kind of elitist sense. Like I think mm-hmm. every student in public schools should be learning like how do I consume information? Because at some point, every single one of them is gonna land on social media and information is gonna be thrown at them. So this is basically just giving them kind of necessary skills to move in the world. Yeah. And how did how did you approach this uh, topic in your in your new book, like about you know the different with the BLM movement and then during the pandemic because mostly people are receiving news about through the social through social media about the the BLM movement. I mean, the focus of the the new book, um, as you're saying, is it's kind of the photojournalistic coverage of Black Lives Matter and COVID, and I was approaching it very much um there is some about social media but there wasn't that the isn't the primary focus the the real focus in that book is that 2020 was like an unprecedented year Mm -hmm. in the world (laughs) and in the news world it was also unprecedented because we had like a once in a century pandemic and then the largest protests in u.s history and they collide at the exact same time and they both bring with them new but different 
like risks and threats and challenges. So that's really what I was focusing on was like, what the heck went on that year? And what did photojournalists have to grapple with in terms of security, physical safety, emotional risks, uh, new ethical dilemmas. So some of it did touch in the realm of social media, but there was the, that wasn't the, the only thing on it. And what were the weirdest things that you discovered from, the, from your investigation? <laughs> Um, sadly, I don't have a whole lot of good news. <laughs> that I just um, it was censorship levels around the whole world spiked that year, um, back to your point of like governments. And it was a super quick and easy way for governments and leaders all over the place to restrict journalistic access, right? Like, no, it's a COVID thing. You can't go, but actually it's not a COVID thing. It's just a way of censoring. Um, I also did a fair bit of research into diversity in U.S. newsrooms, right? Because, of course, Black Lives Matter is about um, systemic racism and racial inequality. And one of the things I was exploring was how does that translate through the journalism as well and the journalists who cover the stories about racial inequality. And it's it's probably not super surprising, like US newsrooms by and large are not that diverse. Um, there's been a push in the recent past to diversify the newsrooms and some newsrooms have done a, a pretty good job of it, but it's still on the whole um, tends towards male and white um, and then especially if you look at what's called leadership positions, right? Like editors, those are really undiversified roles. And that's really something for the journalism community at minimum, but I also think the public should be aware of and thinking about because, you know, leadership, they're, they're making decisions about what information we get. Yeah. Um, so that should be a diversified pool of people. So, wow. so what you're saying is like basically most of the editors are just white men uh, that are the majority yeah majority, I mean, one of the one of the people i interviewed in my book um she's the director of video and photography at the philadelphia yeah. inquirer um and for for all of the statistics right you know like i the the kind of scholar i have this essay that contextualizes things and gives numbers but she said it better than any of my statistics and she i'm paraphrasing but she was basically like i think i'm one of four black photo editors in a traditional newsroom in this entire country, right? And that's like, wow. yeah. Well, one of four in the that, whole country. Yeah, she, like, she's guesstimating off the top of her head, but right, right. Yeah. When, I, when I went and did wow. the research, she's not that off. I think the, the research showed that it was like 3% of leadership positions are black women in the United States. Wow. wow. And uh, <laughs> sorry, I just, I just want to go off go for one it. more point about since we were talking about the so I'm like this is going off on um, seeing noticing a pattern that I've I've been seeing happening in the U.S., which is is liberal democracy going having a downward spiral in uh, in the U.S. because with for, with for example the censorship that's going on and uh, during the pandemic and the, also the, recently we were talking about the Roe versus Wade uh, decision. So, is it is it being is it like altering this whole concept of how the U.S. was operating, and now it's becoming, you know, it's changing into a bit more conservative, maybe slightly authoritarian, authoritative. Uh, I mean, regime. I feel like it's just like given me like a like like go do a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I what I can say is there, it, you know, because I I feel like um, like I don't know if I can speak to all of like liberal democracy, but <laughs> in the realm of journalism, there have been some shifts that are that are not okay. Um, like I said, I I do think there has been more of a conscientious reckoning with a lack of diversity. So I do think newsrooms are paying attention to things like that and trying to correct it. I mean, one of the issues is that it actually takes money um, and journalism is losing money these days 
But if you want to, you know, increase your staff by 10 people in order to have a plurality of photojournalists, you need the money to hire 10 people. Um, so that's, it, it can be, it's easy to say diversify. It's not necessarily quick to implement. But yeah, in terms of some of the other things that are going on in journalism, I do think it's, it's concerning. Um, and some of it is, you know, we, we are now done with the Trump administration, but he really went out of his way to attack journalism. And I, yeah, he's not the only president, he's not the first president, but I do think he had essentially like a megaphone um, in front of his mouth and his comments about journalists being the enemy of the people, you know, he says it here in the United States and it reverberated around the world. And I think it not only had consequences for the US, but emboldened leaders all over the place. Um, and so 2020, right, to come back to the year I focus on in the book, it was the year that witnessed the highest number of attacks against journalists in the United States. Like we had, the, there's plenty of countries where it's dangerous to be a journalist in the US, we hadn't really <laughs> ranked yet, yeah. um, but 2020 we did, we made the lists. Um, so like things like that, and I'm, I feel, pretty certain that it wasn't just that the, the public is kind of like everyone's pissed off that there's a pandemic and that we're trapped at home. It's not just that it's, it's years of hearing that the representatives of press are your enemy and then people get volatile enough and they will start attacking the press. So in that sense, um, I'm not sure it's the entire collapse of liberal democracy, but I, I do think that journalism is fundamental to a functioning democracy. And it's the only industry that is protected by the American constitution. Like there's no other industry that was written into the constitution. So it's considered that fundamental to a healthy society. So when you start attacking the press, either literally or metaphorically, you're in a bad situation. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I agree, but it's, you know, I just, um... I found out that like uh, the distrust towards uh, journalism right now is uh, the highest it's uh, ever been. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people have lost faith with journalists. I don't know. I'm sure you know, like why some people might have those feelings. And I don't know what do you think is the remedy to this? Because journalism is such a, um, a key part of society because we need news. We need information coming in and we need people keeping, you know, everyone in check and reporting everything so we can hold people accountable. But, um, you know, without, if you don't trust the journalists, then um, the people who are doing not great things can get away with doing it, right? So uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? Because mm -hmm. the media landscape, again, in the US, it's so polarized that it's kind of like there's two worlds, right? There's kind of the blue world and the red world. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the other issues, and this goes back maybe to the diversity issue, is that there have been communities and populations that feel like we're not being represented or we're not being represented rightly um, in the media. And, and some of that has to do with racial issues. Some of it has to do with any other kind of demographic issues. But again, that I think like diversifying who the journalists are will help to mitigate that in terms of this crisis of trust, I think at some level, now I'm going to just sound like a broken record. At some <laughs> level, it is about this kind of public media mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the more the public understands, like, how is journalism working? What should it be doing for me? The more you empower the public to critique bad journalism or to consume good journalism and then to kind of rebuild the trust base. I see what you mean. Like if you're um, more aware of the function of journalism and what it's there to serve, you're not supposed to just consume it and just take it for what it is. You're supposed to critique it and you're supposed to take multiple news sources. I see what you mean. And that way um, you can start trusting it a little bit more. Um, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the, the skepticism is it's, it's real. Some of it's healthy, really. Like we shouldn't, as you're saying, like mm -hmm. we should questions of things but I think you're right that we're in a moment where it's actually just kind of a crisis and if you have nothing to believe in then like then you're really lost <laughs> that's so true um I want to yeah go side no I just want to ask like and how important do you, do you think is like 
having faith in a specific narrative is to the public. So like how how much is it of an impact on them if in the in the field of uh, photojournalism because you were saying how if you don't believe in anything then you're probably lost so why is this such an important like why is it an important uh, topic for the people that are taking in the news i mean if i i just can't even imagine a space like if I distrusted everything, I wouldn't even know how to conduct my life, right? Like I wouldn't have to do anything anymore because I'm like, what's real, what's not real? I think everyone, um, I think now we're, now we're pretending I'm a sociologist, which I'm not. <laughs> Every, you know, everyone has their belief systems, right? And they yeah. have the narrative mm -hmm. that they um, feel more strongly about or the sources or the people that they trust more than others. And that to me just seems sort of normal human nature is just how we we work um so i'm i'm just always advocating for a greater critical awareness of um, particularly when it comes to news information and news information that will affect your life or other people's lives but within people that are fix it like they have the strong belief towards one context just make them a bit delusional or like ignorant to the to the general to the general discussion of what and the discourse of the topic that the of the information they receive because if if they're just like focused on one cause how how will we how will they be a bit more skeptical or open-minded to listening to both ends of the story and then having the more clear image of what actually is happening I mean, if, if we're talking about someone who's so completely inside like a bubble, right? And they only get information that supports that bubble. It, it's probably really hard to reach that person in terms of kind of greater civic discourse of multiple voices. Um, but, you know, and again, I, I don't, I haven't researched this particular topic. So maybe what I'm saying is not hundred percent accurate. I would expect that would be behavior more likely to be found in someone older who is more cemented in their ways and their thinking and less likely to change a mindset or to yeah. change their behaviors in terms of how they receive information. And I, I would hope, like, I mean, this is how I feel about my students, that you're more likely to have an open-mindedness if you can teach people when they're young. Right, so true. You're so right about that, <laughs> Lauren. Um, what am I um, gonna say about how do you teach people to become journalists, right? So we have this issue you said about diversity in journalism. You don't have enough diverse people. Um, and so let's uh, help these people become journalists, right? So what are the steps you gotta take in order to become a, um, you know, a conflict journalist, but just a journalist? In terms of like, how do we reach a broader base of people? Yeah, I mean, so so to, to address the issue of like why um, uh, journalism rooms aren't diverse enough, especially leadership, um, I'm not sure if there's like a barrier to entry. You know, why why is it that? Why do you think that uh, these rooms aren't diverse enough? And uh, um, how <laughs> how can how we do, help how people do we improve representation of the yes? Yeah, I mean, okay, so if we're talking in the photo world. Um, I think in some regards, just providing easier access to this study. Um, and even things like, there's a few workshops uh, in the photojournalism world that are, they're, they're really respected. They're strong workshops where anyone who's like a young, early in their career photojournalist can um, apply to get in. And then they're they're free, which is which is great, but even even there, there's actually these unseen barriers because in order to apply to get in, you need to have a body of work, and often that it takes money to do that body of work, right? And if it's going to be, you know, some really strong body of work, sometimes you need the money for all the gear, or you need the money mm -hmm. to fly somewhere, or you know, even for these workshops, like some of them cover your travel and accommodations to attend them, some of them don't. So I think, especially if we're talking about a socioeconomic diversity, which sometimes maps also to racial diversities, cutting down on those kinds of barriers 
is, would be great. And I know that there is a tension on this in the photojournalism world, right? Providing scholarships, trying to open that, those starting point doors um, that traditionally were much harder for so certain socioeconomic classes to even get through those doors. And I think that's part of the issue of why there was this pipeline that was not as diverse as it should be. So I think that's, that's one thing. Um, I think, you know, the, it's, it's extremely kind of complicated, the history of photojournalism, but to boil it down in a nutshell, the major media organizations, particularly for photo, historically grew up in the West, right? You'd have like a, a base in London or Paris or New York, um, which means that you're largely historically sending out photographers from kind of white Western countries to go and cover the rest of the world. And that, again, there's been a lot of pushback on that in the recent past um, and a much more concerted effort uh, for a lot of these organizations to work globally with photographers, because it's not like there's only photographers in London, Paris, and New York, right? Like, yeah. live everywhere. Um, but if you look at the history, that's one of the reasons why also it was a much more white Western um, coverage. So, you know, it's, it's still an imbalanced world. I'm happy that there's a lot more attention and conversation about that and you know I think some of the what are called the wire services like Associated Press, Reuters, Getty um, and they're different from a specific publication because they will work with photographers all around the world and then they send those images to any publication that has a subscription right so um someone who works for Reuters could have their image published in a hundred newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the wire services have done really a pretty good job of hiring photojournalists all around the world. Um, so that I think has been an important shift over time, but you know, it's like you see the problem and then you have to wait for the solutions. And while you're waiting for the solution, you're like, why isn't it done yet? Um, yeah. You know, I hope I'm hopeful that um, the future is, you know, more diverse and a lot of people around the world will get have the ability. I think, to, I think we are yeah. definitely trending in that direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you know, the technology has made it also a lot easier, right? It's like you don't need to have an expensive camera anymore. You know, you just have a, a phone and yeah. you can take all the photos you need. Um, do you encourage your students to just take their phones to go out and take photos or do you um, you know, suggest people learn the art of photography if they're going to get into the business? For the students of mine who want to go into photojournalism, um, they are working on DSLR. Like they mm -hmm. are using um, a, a tool, right? Because it's just another tool. They're using a tool that will give them more capabilities and control than a phone. But I do think that phone photography can be really strong too. Um, so in some of my classes where I'll give them photo assignments, but they're not necessarily going to professionalize in photography. Using their phones is absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. Completely. Wow. <laughs> Using your phones in class is fine. That was a lot different than when we were kids. <laughs> yeah, um, I told them to take the phones out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask you um, about, um, so you're into conflict photojournalism. Um, maybe you can um, tell us a bit why, but I, you know, we've met many people, journalists who uh, covered conflicts in Russia, China, Middle East, uh, South, you know, South America, and Africa. There's conflicts everywhere. <laughs> so how do how do um, you keep up um, with your work? Um, yeah. So I mean, I I'm not running into the conflict zones, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the I'm working with a lot of photographers who might be in conflict zones. Um, and I'm teaching about, I'm kind of the cultural critic who is mm -hmm. thinking about the role of those images. Um, so it, as far as keeping up, I don't have to get on a plane all the time. So it's, it's, not, it's not too arduous in that sense. I think the way in which it can be arduous is that a lot of what I focus on can be really heavy or really mm -hmm. graphic um, and kind of just 
it, even as a teacher, when I teach courses about conflict photography, I have learned over the years to check in with my students and give them breaks because it can really take a, it can, it can really kind of hit you really pretty heavy sometimes. Um, yeah. So one of the things that's important to me in the way I think about conflict photography is it's, it's super vital on many levels. Um, but as far as the photojournalists themselves and the photo editors, I would say keeping them aware of emotional self-care is super important. And do you want to tell us a bit more about how, you know, uh, you do that because you're, you know, the professor consuming all this information from all these places and filtering through them. Um, so yeah, is it, <laughs> do you like enjoy the con like conflicts? Is it, or not conflicts, but the, I'm sure you enjoy the work. But, I, I enjoy my work. No, yeah. I do not enjoy it. I've been to my conflict um, and have seen way too many awful images of things mm -hmm. that I wish had never happened to people. I'm going to be um, a bit psychopathic you, if you did. <laughs> I, <would say. laughs> I, I do feel it's um, important, right? Like people are suffering violations or human rights injustices and it shouldn't happen in the dark, right? They, it shouldn't happen, period. But if it does happen, then others should be aware. There should be evidence. Perpetrators should be held accountable. So I do feel that it is important Important work in terms of how do I like deal with that that stuff I have to say I um I feel very inspired and and frankly just privileged to be able to walk into a classroom and be with people who care about these issues too who want to think it through with me who want to discuss it and talk about it and so I draw a lot from my students actually mm. oh wow that's interesting mm -hmm. and I wanted I wanted to know more about uh, which which conflict did you find like the 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 most interesting for you to cover? Which one were you more most the most interested in? Obviously, I'm not uh, not <laughs> trying to like make anything. I'm not trying to make something like less important or anything like that. But obviously, as some uh, people, everyone has their own preference. Like for um, us, it would be our own country. Right. Okay. I see. I don't. I actually don't know that I, I can prioritize. A, a, I think it's more that I have more knowledge of certain conflicts than others. So I feel more equipped to talk about them um, mm -hmm. more than others. But I don't, I don't think I could say like, I prefer this one <laughs> to that <laughs> one. Um, I mean, even just, you know, the new book is about COVID and Black Lives Matter um, and the Black Lives Matter movement started here and COVID of course was part of everybody's life but I don't feel like those are my f favorites even though I I'm right here with them um it's yeah it's I think I can't I can't say <laughs> okay then conflict to let me let me change it a bit and ask like what is what is a conflict that you would like to and like learn more about maybe that would be a bit uh, easier to answer um it's not easier to answer. It's not? <laughs> okay. No, I mean, mostly just because I think, especially if it is a place I've never been to before, it's not just learning about a conflict. It becomes learning a, a history and a culture. Um, and I, I find that just fascinating. Like, I, I love learning histories. Um, so, I like, the cultural critic in me is drawn, I guess, drawn towards conflicts that are occurring now, because I work in journalism and journalism is about news that is happening now, as opposed to conflicts that happened a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. But also I would say, because in terms of how photojournalists work and the safety and security issues they face, they're constantly changing and updating. So I'm very interested in learning about that. Like it's, it's so, important now for someone heading into certain kinds of hostile environments to understand digital security, which isn't a thing that you really had to do, you know, a few decades ago, but now it needs to be like standard practice for certain journalists going into certain spaces. So like those sorts of things interest me. So more of a futuristic uh, mind, like uh, viewpoint, because 
we've actually we've actually talked about this a few times on the podcast about for example ai and like what's the future for ai so how what do you think the ai's influence has on the photojournalism and the future of it because i feel like there's it's ai is going to be in every in every field it's going to influence every field some way somehow it's going to be there and now that you're saying that obviously photojournalism has like digital security to worry about how do you think ai can get involved in that i mean I, when i was saying digital security i was even thinking in terms of their own personal safety um because yeah how can you leave a digital trace you're trackable um and if if, if bad actors want to go after you and track you like you need to be very careful about that in terms of the ai question um yeah, I mean, we're, we're like walking into a landscape where the public can't tell the difference between deep fakes and actual photographs. It, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a new terrain. Um, there is an initiative called the Content Authenticity Initiative um, that is kind of overseen by Adobe, but it's really a consortium of a lot of media companies, tech companies, and it's, aim is to be a global standard that helps to ensure the provenance, um, basically helps you to verify the actuality of a photograph. Uh, so I do think that that is one step forward in this crazy landscape of fake visuals and uh-huh. disinformation um, to have a tool to be able to say, wait, let me check the authenticity of this image. Is it really what it claims to be? <laughs> it's like an AI tool checking for uh, checking of the AI, <laughs> like that photo is AR, AI or not, it's like AI <laughs> finding AI. And it's like, it's so wild because I remember, you know, on deep fakes, like I saw a video of uh, President Zelensky and it was him talking about something that he never said and him saying things that never happened. And I, when I found out it was a deep fake, I was like, whoa, um, <laughs> how am I supposed to know what's like? real or not it is kind of horrifying yeah yeah it's, yeah and also with the so I'm, I'm i don't know if you've heard if you heard about uh the ai that was debated if it's if it's become sentient at google where there was this employee that was having this discussion with uh, an ai and it was talking about how it was afraid of death and like it was experiencing some sort of human emotions or understanding and like basically thinking by itself instead of thinking of like like a program so continuing on that uh, on the point of ai and in photojournalism if ai becomes sentient like what kind of correlation would you see or like connection would you see between these two fields man i don't even know like we're <laughs> <laughs> write, write your dissertation on that side. <laughs> we're, we're out of my I think we're I'm, in I'm, future right now. <laughs> I think at this point, uh, I'm just giving ideas to your stu- your future yeah. students or your current students. It's like, watch this podcast, and you're gonna yes. have some dissertations <laughs> ideas. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're kind of wrapping up on time, so I don't know if you want to ask one more question before we. Uh, I'll leave it to you, Adi. Well, I'm just. Um, I just want to know a little bit about did you ever want to um like travel yourself and be a like an actual um like right now you're uh you write books you're in the academia of conflict photojournalism but have you ever traveled someplace to take photos and um you're directly involved in a conflict yes yeah. exactly um i do not go anywhere claiming to be the professional photographer um uh, mm-hmm. but i have done work in spaces that I, I would call like aftermath. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And including like, I I do a decent amount of work in Bosnia and their war concluded 25 plus years ago. And it's still a country that in some regards is very resonant with like the war feels like it's just under the surface because the, the social healing that needed to happen hasn't really happened at a fundamental level. And I I find that as worthy of exploration as the conflicts themselves. So I, you know, again, like I'm not, 
I do not need to walk into a space where, you know, buildings are being bombed and bullets are flying. Um, and there are the people who do who mm -hmm. are courageous, producing wonderful, important work. Um, They're also slightly wild. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is an interesting career choice, right? But I think the people who do it long enough, they really, first of all, they, they, they develop a savvy for how to move around these spaces. And I, I think they are very committed to journalism at that very fundamental level, right? It is about producing documentation and raising awareness. Um, and I respect that. And, but yeah, so I do, I do get to travel for my work um, and I get to do it more safely than some of these other journalists. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so I guess that's uh, almost a wrap on time. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lauren, for your time here today. Um, we're going to leave a link to your website, your socials, your um, all that in the bio. People can check um, out your work. And um, yeah, what's uh, next in store for you? Um, next in store, I'm. I mentioned the content authenticity initiative. Um, and I am heading up their education. So I kept kind of hammering on this, like media literacy is important. Uh, mm -hmm. So we are developing a media literacy curriculum for middle schools, high schools. Yeah, so, let's go. That's so awesome. Since that's out, we can link to that too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. All right. And before we end, actually, I, I something uh, I want to present. <laughs> Maybe it's like a new idea we can try out. Sure. But And because we don't usually do this. Um, Professor, do you have a question for us that you'd like to ask? Um, because we've been asking you questions the whole the whole mm, time. <laughs> so like now it's trying to switch. Professor and I get to do all the talking. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm always mm. curious to know what what do you think are the most impactful images from the recent past? Recent past. For me, the first thing that pops to my mind is the. The little Palestinian girl who's who's white and blonde hair, and she's like arguing with an ISF soldier. This this wasn't too long ago, and the reason why I find it impactful is because, especially when the Ukrainian war started, mm -hmm. they they misused this image and started saying like, oh, she's a European a little girl fighting against like the army or something like that. But then everyone who's Palestinian and like Arab started resharing the image and talking about how it's like, no, this is a little Palestinian girl she just looks European because some in some countries in the Arab world they do have these genetics where we can look a bit European so yeah that was a that was an, an iconic image especially since she also got I think arrested after that confrontation oh, wow. and she's like only 10 or 11 ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, for me I feel like uh, the most recent one I saw was uh the one in China during the most recent lockdowns where they had a, um, like everyone was locked down in their homes and then there were there was a drone flying around the town. Saying, oh yeah, oh my God. Suppress your soul's desire for freedom or something like that as it's flying around telling everyone to stay inside and like catching people to go outside just that video. That was like the most recent thing that I'm like, you know, I really got transported into that world. But for me, the most like, impactful thing of recent history has to be like the you know the Beirut port explosion that video of just a huge explosion that happened especially for me you know I have a lot of family and friends that were in um Beirut at the time and I was here in you know Los Angeles and uh yeah I remember like those videos uh were uh like shook me you know and I'll never forget them yeah yeah, yeah I remember I was well, there actually when it happened but I was a bit far off. I could see the the whole explosion. And the first thing that I was thinking of, because like you see the explosion happen and it's a, it's a mushroom cloud. So what do you, what's the first thing that popped in your head? <laughs> the first thing that popped in my head was yeah. like a nuclear explosion. I'm like, oh, we're, <laughs> like um, we're dead. Like, that's the first thing that popped in my head. And I just froze staring outside. So yeah, that's that was definitely an impactful moment. More of the, it was an impactful moment more than a photo. That's why, that's why I didn't say it's a, mm -hmm. like a 
Yeah, we're yeah. all looking at it. Yeah, it's like in, in front of me. I didn't even put that. Your reaction to it, though, was informed by visuals that you've seen in the past, right? Which is why you thought Mushroom Cloud, because we've seen those, mm -hmm. visuals, whether yeah. like actual World War II images or the kind of Hollywood recreations of those things. I mean, this this to me is super, like how how the visuals that we've seen influence the way we react to the visuals that are now coming to us. Like that to me is yeah. really yeah. interesting. Yes, very true. Wow, that was a great question, <laughs> Professor Lauren. Thank you so much for your time. How amazing. Let's sign out here. All right. Uh, peace, love, happiness. Adios, amigos. Uh, thank you so